We keep things rolling here on the Sports Cubicle. I'm your host, Mike Mercado. I'm joined with the one, the only, Paul Shavari and Pauly. This has been something that we've kind of been keeping our eyes on. Everything that's going on with college sports, the NIL, and the entire economic structure that is going on with these institutes, with these athletes, and the future of college sports. And there is a report coming out now. Something that you were bringing up before we hit on the mics that really piqued my interest. And I want to run this by from USA Today. Would a collective bargaining agreement in college football minimize bowl game opt-outs? This is from Evan Desai over at the Arizona Republic. The NIL world has opened doors for college athletes to earn their share of money for their performance. Per ESPN senior writer Heather Dench, among the conversations around NIL, rules and regulations being put into place, there are bowl leaders interested in a collective bargaining agreement established among the players that would aid in minimizing the number of postseason opouts. Executive Director of Bowl Season Nick Carparelli shed some light on that at the Fiesta Bowl Spring Summit. His feel for the situation after speaking with conference commissioners and president of the NCAA, Charlie Baker, was that NIL collectives are likely to set to be brought in-house and that discussions would have been regarding contracts being exchanged for NIL payments. While Carparelli did say that bowl season does not make an official count for how many players opt out of bowl games, his estimate is that approximately eight players on each team opt out of bowls. He expects these contracts to cut into that number. So check out that entire article over at USA Today from Evan Desai. Would a collective bargaining agreement in college football minimize bowl game opt-outs? Now, Paulie, I'm going to throw it to you in a second because I want to take away what I'm about to say as in the actual issue I have with all this because I actually think your idea on the field for the sport is actually a really great idea. But I want to talk about kind of the, the nuance before we get to the fun stuff of what you actually think can help fix the sport of college football beyond just Absolutely. national champions. This is all a television product to begin with. The reason why there's so many bowl games is not because they're prestigious. It's not because the Mayo Bowl is a game that everybody wants to win in the Big Ten or the SEC. It's because ESPN and CBS decided we need more television shows for our audience that is junkies for college football. And to be upset, to hear bowl leaders, these these con people who are there to just show their product placement all over a stadium and have these college kids, you know, hoist up a dumb Nokia phone or something mm -hmm. to be complaining about, we need these players to opt in. These contracts are what killing them. Well, let me make one thing perfectly clear, and I think you agree with me. If I could be a starting linebacker in the NFL for the LA Chargers, the Vegas Raiders, the Green Bay Packers, and the difference of me tearing my ACL or not tearing my ACL is playing in the gingerbread bowl, I think I'm going to decide to not play and opt out. I think that's what makes this so, makes me so angry is the disingenuousness of this conversation. This isn't coming from the students of these institutes, even from the players of these institutes. It's coming from the CEOs and the marketing people from these big time bowl games. And let's also make one thing clear. They just said eight players per team. Those are the only ones who are going to make a career outside of college football that are opting out, people who are going to play in the NFL. These aren't the day-to-day -day players that make up most of these rosters. That was my thing because before we get to the actual fun of what could be your idea, the idea that this is even coming up because of, <laughs> of bowl members is what just kind of drives me up the wall because they're part of the problem. Well, okay, so the first thing that cracks me up is like, oh, so there is money that we can give to these guys. You know, it's like it's funny that when push comes to shove that, you know, like, oh, some funds have uh, opened up for these guys. I, I understand what the NCAA is trying to do here, you know, what the intentions are, you know, they're trying to sell their product. I was kind of looking this up while you were talking. In my lifetime, uh, so, so when I was born, there were only 12 bowl games total. Only 12 bowl games total. That's okay. crazy. It could be a little off on the numbers here, but th that's what I counted on a quick count. Since I came into this world, 30 bowl games have come into existence. That's unreal. No, I know some have come and gone. Some have changed, uh, you know, names so much, you know, because I know that it wasn't the guaranteed rate bowl when it started in 1980, whatever. You know, it was probably something else. Um, and the newest one starting in, uh, what, 2023 was the uh, famous Toastery Bowl, which <laughs> 
Let's go, <laughs> Pristine. Yeah. So I, I liked the, what was it, the Duke's Mayo Bowl? The, that's what was like the, yeah. the, guy, the giant Duke's Mayo. Elk uh, Grove. Yeah. yeah Elk yeah. Grove Village had a bowl that's game. Right. right? Like, that's where we're at. What are we talking about? <laughs> All right. Plop. What was the, the, um, yeah. What's that tiny little village, uh, uh, the village of Bedford Park? Yeah, yeah the village of yeah, Bedford come Park. On, dude. Come open a business. In the- Shout out to both. <laughs> Shout out to both for shining. We don't want to stop any of their shine. Um, but but oh, you had a great idea. I think, like, I know uh, before, uh, as you continue your thought, but don't. I do think that behind all this, there is a way to have a serious conversation about what this actually is, who's behind the complaints, what they're looking for. And for the sports fan, some way you can actually make this entertaining, too. Well, okay, so I think I've brought this up on this show before. I, I, I don't remember whatever, you know, has made it on the air and off the air, you know, between our conversations. But the... I can make college football way more interesting than it is already, okay? And and we already, like, we're in this era where the conferences mean nothing. They mean nothing. And I know that um, people are going to get really upset when they hear my idea, but at the same time, this is a way better idea than what, what it is right now, okay? So we know that all these bowl games are meaningless, other than, like, you know, the college football playoff, you know? Um, at, at the same time, there's the nice little traditions, you know, yes. when, when the when the Rose Bowl is not part of the playoff, you know, that, but at the same time, the Gator it's, Bowl. it's, you know, like there's that. no more Pac-10 anymore, yeah. so, so the Rose Bowl is kind of meaningless there. You know, the Gator Bowl, the Sun Bowl, you know, yeah. that's existed since the 30s. There are some good ones, just like the, not everything is a a major in, in in golf, right? Like, there are some great tournaments. Well, the traditions are neat, and it's, um, you know, it reminds me of a conversation I had with somebody years ago who was this big Notre Dame fan, and he thought he knew everything about college football. And this is when they started talking about doing the playoff system, I think, with the the four teams or whatever. Because before, I, I think back back then it was the one versus two. And then there was always controversy because, like, the three might be, yeah. you know, worthy enough to make it. It was the committee so, making these yeah, decisions. Yeah, yeah. So he was, you know, we're talking about, like, um, oh, yeah, you know, how are they going to do it? And I was like, well, yeah, you know, they'll use, like, the Rose Bowl and all that. But I was like, don't be surprised if um, the Cotton Bowl isn't played at the Cotton Bowl. It's played at Jerry World, which ended up happening. You know, which oh, makes no, sense. That'll never happen. That'll never. And it's like, no, like, bro, they want money. Yeah. They're, they're not going to put this thing in a podunky little 1940s bowl. They're going to put this in, like, an actual super mega stadium where they can sell the snot out of it for billions of dollars. Okay, so my plan is is to divide up the entire thing, get rid of the conferences. All of the Division I teams are all kind of placed into tiered systems, not unlike soccer everywhere else in the world. So like the English Premier League, Bundesliga, like that. So there'd be the top tier. And, you know, it's it's going to be uh, contentious at the beginning, but it's all the teams that have performed well over the last few years. You can figure out whatever coefficients you want to use to determine who the best programs are. You have a top tier that has your Alabama, Ohio State, Notre Dame, Georgia, and, you know, I think we, you, you, I'd have to play with the numbers a little bit, but let's say that there's 12 to, to 16 teams or whatever. The bowl games at the end of the season would be determining who gets relegated out of that league and who the champion is, okay? So, you know, we'd have to obviously play with this and figure out, you know, how, how this would work exactly. But And and I did this over the, the holidays. I kind of, for fun, was trying to figure this out, and I don't have the sheet in front of me. But you could divide this up into, I think, like seven or eight different tiers and then have, you know, the bottom tier try and work its way up and then the teams that get relegated, you know, because year to year, yes, it changes. But at the same time... Um, you know, it's up to the strength of the program, you know? So it's like, yeah, you, the top recruits are going to want to go to the premier league. You know, they're going to want to play for the Alabamas and the Georgias and this and that, but there's always going to be a bad team out of there. You know, there's always teams that look great on paper, Colorado, and then end up being terrible after they play their non-conference, Colorado, schedule, Colorado. Um, you know, where coaches suddenly quote, have time to uh, chat on Twitter. I don't have, <laughs> I, we don't have time to deal with, with his nonsense. I mean, shout out to prime who doesn't love prime, but he's ridiculous. Oh so my God. Gosh, yeah, what yeah. was uh, I, I, the best roast I heard of him is he's Lavar Ball the headset. Oh, that's mean, <laughs> Lavar Ball. Which Where's never the lost. Lie? Where's well, the lie? Super Bowls. Yeah, uh, yeah, least yeah. ones got championships. Yeah, never yeah. lost. Never lost. Yeah. Hey, what is uh, Lavar Ball played for the Jets? I'm sure uh, that qualified him to be parents of. Anyway, okay. So, um, so what I'm saying though is that a top tier system. So the top programs go into the system the first year and have a chance to either win the whole thing, stay in the stay in it for next year, or get relegated out into 
to the, the second tier. And then there's second tier teams, probably your your Tennessees and your uh, uh, Michigan States or, you know, whoever, you know, Iowa, whoever, that try and work their way up into the Premier League. Every team has a chance. You know, this is where, like, your Tulsa's, if they're consistently great and keep winning that tier. And it's like, you know, it'd be like two or three teams get, get promoted, two or three teams get relegated. You could figure out the logistics in this, but could you imagine every week you get a prime matchup? You get an Alabama versus Ohio State in October rather than waiting until January when guys might be injured, it might be a little bit different, but then week to week you have, no matter what, a prime matchup. Now your bowl games in December and January turn into championship games. This is where the Boca Raton Bowl is now important because you have Southeast Mississippi State going up against uh, you know Northwestern Oregon or whatever, you know, or Portland State to try to determine who's going to make it into the sixth tier, you know? Sure. That's yeah, way better yeah, yeah, than yeah, watching yeah. some meaningless meaningless game on a Wednesday before Christmas where there's nobody in the stadium. So I think there's a lot that you can that can be tweaked and will make it as an idea work. I think expansion. I think it should be 24 teams. I think there's the idea of uh, what makes a team relegated, uh, how you should keep the identity of your conference, because there should be some bragging rights of the Big Ten has seven premier teams while SEC has eight and so on See, and so forth. I, like, I wouldn't even do it that way. I would just go with the coefficient of how programs have performed over the last four to six years or whatever, determine who the best. And, and the reason why I picked like 12 to 16 is because uh, the amount of games that are going to have sure. to be played. Um, I mean, of course, this is just a, like a, a kind of a half baked idea. But this idea that you can have ideas, upon, like it can be fun, it can be worked on, it can mm-hmm. be tweaked. Because at the end of the day, this conversation started on one thing: this is a television product. Mm-hmm. So it's getting, and you're and saying every week you will have a top tier match. You will have six to to ten or whatever top tier matchups every week. You will know what your your Sunday night game or Saturday night game is. And I think what it's most important is the transparency. The NIL deals, these contracts, these coaches, these ADs, these colleges, these institutes, the networks, the fan base, everybody involved. Everybody should keep everything up front, on top of table, full transparency. It is a TV product. This is a factory. Most of these guys are using it for scholarship to be in college. This is the highest they'll get up to. Some other cats are going to the NFL. Their bodies are their temples. There are going to be reasons for them to opt out. But at the end of the day, as everybody is up front with each other and honest, your idea, whatever tweaks may come from it, whatever the idea may end up being, can work if we're all honest about it. But, Paulie, any final thoughts? This was a fun conversation on a very busy edition of the Sports Cubicle. I, you know, it's the reason why I thought of this is because you watch all of these top tier European soccer leagues, and it's like, you know, wow, if only we had like something like that in the United States. Well, we do. It's it's college football. Look at the the fervor, the fanfare. You know, like uh, the people, the tribalism, people in song. You know, uh, you know, it's 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 the the pride. You know, so I think that's that's why. But at the same time, like, when does the Egg Bowl ever matter? Do you even know what two teams are in the Egg Bowl? I'll give you a hint. They're both Southeastern Conference. I will say it is the. Um, so think of the two like just Harper most... Hawks and the College of the no, Page. Pick two Oaks. SEC schools that never win championships. Mississippi State's and. And big rivalry in state. Ole Miss? Yeah, wow. that's the Egg Bowl. You know what I'm saying? Wow, like, I can't believe I pulled that yeah, one completely yeah, exactly. out of my that's, sports But butt. that's what I'm saying. Yeah, like, yeah. when does that ever matter? Yeah. You know, like, I think what, like, between the two of them, they have a couple of uh, yeah, good that, seasons it, in the last it decade. Matter. But but that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's like they're, they're, they're fodder. They're, they're uh, you know, Alabama plays an easy schedule for, for you know, what they're given. Mm-hmm. And then also, you know, for, for some of those games, like the Mississippi State's Ole Misses, whoever's the, the bottom of the pack. And then you have, like, they'll play, like, Alabama A&M. And I, I, I'm done with that. I'm I'm done with the small schools uh, leeching off the big schools and the big schools getting easy wins off the little schools. I get that there's money involved, but when you have this tiered system, you can have actual television contracts revolve around that and have these schools making certain money. And then you can have wealth redistribution from the top tier every week having prime matchups versus like, no, no one cares about Vanderbilt, man. Nobody. Except for the ultimate partner in all this, the gambling networks and partners. Interesting, huh? We want to know your thoughts. We're on Twitter at Sports Cubicle TV. We're on YouTube at the Sports Cubicle. Wherever you get your favorite podcast, Apple, Spotify, at Sports from the College, the Sports Cubicle, of course, at Heartland Signal at the Sports Cubicle. Shout out to everybody checking us out here on WCPT 820 AM. A very fun edition of the Sports Cubicle conversation here on the Sports Cubicle with the one and only Paul Shavari. I'm Mike Mercado.